Let me turn on the recording. Share the screen. I was trying to figure out why we fell behind, and then it occurred to me this is the summer. For some reason, they didn't extend the lecture time, but they did extend the lab time. And so I told you at the start of the term, we're going to spend at least 10, 15 minutes, maybe half an hour, continuing the lecture so that I can get caught up. So I am going to resume talking about Chapter 3. Any questions about that? I thought about even changing the lecture in the lab, but decided I better not because it's in the schedule of catalog that way. And I will just take some of the lab time, which we don't really need, two hours worth of lab. But I do need more than an hour and 20 minutes for the lecture. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the lecture. And then after that, we will be discussing Lab 3, Microscope Basics. Any question about any of that? All right. So we talked about this slide, and that's all we got done in Chapter 3. So you do need to understand the metric system. And the units of the metric system are shown in this table here. Let me see if I can blow that up. So when we're talking about meters for distance, uh, you need to know a kilometer, and you should know a centimeter, a millimeter, a micrometer, and probably you should also know a nanometer. The reason being is the nanometer is the size that you can see things under the electron microscope. A micrometer is the size of the things under a light microscope. A millimeter is the smallest unit on a uh, ruler. I was trying to see if I have a ruler around here. Uh, ten of the smallest units on a ruler are a centimeter, and I don't know how to word it better. I believe 2.4 centimeters equals one inch. And then a hundred centimeters equal a meter. And then a thousand meters is one kilometer. So you should know these terms and be able to convert between one and another. Any question about that? You should also know the prefixes and then put the prefix with the other unit of measurement. Like for weight, we have grams instead of meter. And for volume, we have uh, liters instead of meter. So you should know these terms with those other units, too. You do not need to convert between metric and English, and that's hard. Converting between metric and English. The only one I know off the top of my head is, is 2.4 centimeters per one inch. And then a meter is a little bit longer, if I remember this right, than one foot. Or not one foot, three feet. All the others I don't know. Okay? So you should know a nanometer. You get uh, uh, 10 times 9 of them, meaning 10 to the ninth of them, to make up one meter. A micrometer, you get 10 times 10 to the six of them to make one meter. A millimeter, you get a thousand or one times into the three of them to make a meter. A centimeter, you get a hundred of them to make a meter. And then you get a thousand meters to make a kilometer. So you should all know that and then convert. And usually what I do when I'm converting from one unit to another, like let's say I'm converting to picometers to uh, 
micrometers, for example. I don't go directly from picometers to micrometers. My mouse is dying. What I do is I go picometers to meter and then meters to uh, micrometers just because I have everything in my brain recorded for meters. Okay, And that's a good way to do it. You could remember it totally that a uh, hundred centimeters are in a meter and then you take uh, 10 millimeters and a centimeter etc. You could memorize all of that if you wanted. The good thing about it is is that the metric units are based on a uh, multiple of 10 so that uh, Oh, let's go from micrometers. There's a thousand micrometers in a millimeter, and ten millimeters in a centimeter, and a hundred centimeters in a meter, because we're skipping the decimeter. Any question about that? You are expected to understand the metric system, and you will be quizzed on it. I do have some study guides on it as well as uh, some practice quizzes on it if you want to practice using the metric system and you can use that. There are two very good reasons for using the metric system. One is shown right here. All of the countries in color are the countries in the world that do not use the metric system and as you can notice there's only one big country in the world that does not use the metric system. And in truth, the United States is slowly converting to using the metric system. And it was actually proposed in con Congress when, oh, who was the president? Uh, sorry, I'm drawing a blank on my name. Who's the third president of the United States? Washington, Adams, Jefferson. So when President Jefferson was president, he proposed that the United States slowly convert to switch over from using the metric system, I mean using the English system, to start using the metric system. And the United States is converting. It's just that we're doing it very, very slowly. And you'll notice that on some street signs they'll have miles per hour as well as kilometers per hour and I think on almost all cars now they give the miles per hour as well as well as the kilometers per hour that you're traveling so we are slowly converting it's just going to take a long time because the United States is not really wanting to convert all right the second reason why you should know the metric system is science and medicine both use the metric system. Like when the doctor prescribes a medication, they don't say, take so many ounces of a drug. They will say, take so many grams of the drug. Or they will say, give the patient so many cc's of, I don't know, penicillin or something like that. And a cc is a cubic centimeter, which is one milliliter. Any question about any of that? All right. So you need to know the metric system for two reasons. Science and, and medicine use the metric system. And most of the countries in the world use the metric system. Any questions? Um, you can look on my Canvas website. I don't think I have it open. I, I only opened the Zoom. I've got a link for some practice quizzes on using the metric system. And I think there's actually three of them. All right, you should also know the typical sizes of microorganism. The size can vary. Like if you know a human, not a human, a, a uh, a chicken egg is much larger than 500 micrometers. But a prokaryotic cell 
ranges from about one micrometer to 10 micrometer. Most prokaryotic cells are on the size of one to three micrometers. Uh, viruses are smaller than that, and the largest virus in its diameter is about 0.44 micrometers, which is about the size of the very smallest prokaryotic cell. And then by length, the largest is about Ebola, which is one micrometers. However, it's not very wide, so Ebola is not the largest virus in diameter. Uh, the largest we're going to talk about is megavirus, and it's about 0 0.044 micrometers in diameter. And for a rule of thumb, you can say that the eukaryotic cells are about 10 times larger than prokaryotic cells, which are about 10 times larger than a virus. To see prokaryotic cells, you need a microscope. For many eukaryotic cells to see them, you need a microscope. But obviously, larger prokaryotic cells, we can see with the human eye. And uh, if you look very closely at a watermelon, you'll see a shape, uh, hexagonal or octagonal, I'm not sure what the shape is. And you'll see that shape in the core of the watermelon. That is actually a cell of that watermelon. So our human, cell, human eyes can see cells in watermelons because they're large enough. Uh, this slide is showing you uh, the sizes of things. You only need to know the relative sizes. You don't need to know the exact size. And do be careful. There's an error in the chart. And I've got it right here. That shouldn't be one micrometer. That should be one millimeter. And we can see things a little smaller than frog eggs. We cannot generally see most eukaryotic cells, although a frog egg is a eukaryotic cell. And for smaller things, we need the microscope to see. And then for even smaller things, we need the electron microscope to see. All right, any question about this? When we're talking about the light, uh, microscope in the lab, we normally use a compound light microscope. A compound microscope is one that has two or more magnification lenses. And there will be an uh, objective lens and an ocular lens that magnify the specimen in a compound microscope. A compound light microscope, I should say. There are other lenses, but they do not magnify, like the condenser lens. The purpose of the condenser lens is to make a cone of light come up and hit the specimen. So that lens does not magnify. Um, the objective lens is the one that can change. And in the lab, we have compound microscopes that have four objective lenses, and they typically magnify four times, 10x times, 40x times, and 100x times. The total magnification is the magnification of the ocular lens times the magnification of the objective lens. In our lab, all of the ocular lenses have a 10x magnification. And so the total magnification of the 4x lens then would be 40x. Of the 10x lens, it would then be 100x. Okay? There are other ocular lenses. They're not very common. Most ocular lenses are 10x. But like on a child's toy microscope, it might be only a 4x ocular lens. And 
I've never seen uh, a 4X lens on a lens in the in the schools. Okay. And then the very best microscopes, which we do not have in a college microscope lab, will have an ocular lens that can magnify 20x times. That would be the most expensive microscope, and it has to be a very well-made microscope, because to magnify that times, meaning 20 times 100 would be 12, 2,000 times. To magnify that time, you have to have a very well-made microscope that uh, works very well to magnify to that degree. Any question about that? All right. In the microscope, you should know all of the different parts that are labeled here, particularly the ocular lens, the arm, the objective lenses, the stage for holding the slide, the clips for holding the slide and moving the slide, uh, the condenser, which is uh, this part, well, on this microscope I'm not entirely certain. It looks like the condenser is this part here, and the Irish diaphragm is this part here. Uh, sometimes that's reversed on a microscope. Uh, the lamp, which gives the light source, you should also know the, the uh, obviously the switch for turning it on, the lamp on, and then the coarse focus, the big knob, and then the fine focus, the uh, little knob. And I'm not seeing that here. Uh, let me see if it's on another picture. I'm not seeing it. Usually the, uh, the clips move with the controller to move the clips. And I'm not seeing it on this microscope. And it's obviously not labeled on this microscope. Okay, so you should know those parts of the microscope. You can have a simple microscope which only has one magnification lens. And we talked about Antoni van Leeuwenhoek and how he made the best microscope of his days. And he made simple microscopes that had only one magnification lens. A simple light microscope, really all it is is a super duper magnifying lens. Okay? Any question about that? You should know that resolution is the ability of the lenses to be able to distinguish two separate points as separate points. A microscope with a resolving power of 0.2 micrometers can distinguish between two points that are equal to or greater than two, 0.2 micrometers. But if ever you have two points that are closer than 0.2 micrometers for this microscope, you will not be able to see the points as two distinct points. The resolution limit of white light is approximately 0.2 micrometers or two nanometers, or 200 nanometers. And that is just because of the wavelength of light. We can only magnify it so many times. And so the resolution limit is for two points to be seen as two points with using white light, you have to have them separated by 0 0.2 micrometers. Otherwise, you will not be able to distinguish them as being two separate points. As I mentioned, the best compound microscopes that can be made can magnify total magnification 2,000 times. The highest total magnification of our scopes in the microbiology lab 
is not the best, our scopes can only magnify a thousand times for their total magnification. So these two points can be seen under the image as two separate points, so they can be resolved. But all of these points are a blur. Well, at least all of those points. You might be able to say these are different than those. So we cannot distinguish these. We cannot resolve them as separate entities under the light microscope. Any question about any of that? So that's resolution. Another term you need to know with the microscope is refraction. Refraction is the bending of light when light passes from one medium to another. For example, the light passing through the glass of water and then passing through the air, light bends wherever the light changes media, meaning at the water surface. And that makes it look like that pencil is bent. Right? And that's from the refraction of light. That pencil is not bent. It is just the refraction that makes it look bent. And that is actually why we use oil to stop the bending of light. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But let's talk a little bit more about refraction. Refraction is extremely important for animals, like a bird that is hunting fish in the water. When the bird sees the fish in the water, it doesn't actually see it in its actual position down here. The bird sees the fish because of the refraction of light in this position here where the fish is not. The fish is down there. But because of the bending of light right here at the water-air interface, uh, light is refracted. And so to the bird, it looks like the fish is here. This is important for animals to understand because if this bird were to put its claws into fish to try and catch this fish here, the fish is not there. The bird knows that even though the fish looks like it's here, it's deeper down, and the bird will put its claws deeper down in the water. And that the bird just knows by instinct. Okay? But I'm just trying to point out why refraction is important for life. On the microscope, uh, refraction is important because when the light hits the slide and then comes out into the air, some of that light will be refracted, taking on another angle, meaning light is bent. The light that is bent away from the lens cannot be collected by the lens. And that's the advantage of using oil. If we didn't have oil, some of the light will come out of the slide, hit the air and be bent, and it will be bent again when it hits the glass of the, the ocular lens. That light can be collected. But this light here is bent at a higher angle, and the light ray will be bent away from the ocular lens the ocular lens cannot collect this light. If we use oil in between the glass slide and the ocular lens, we will remove the refraction of light. The reason is, is that oil has the same refractive index as glass, and so when the light moves from the glass to the oil, the light is not refracted, it's not bent, and that means this ray of light can be, which would be shown here, can be collected by the lens. So if we use oil, we can collect more light, and that will increase the resolution of the light microscope. Therefore, 
immersion oil is used, especially with the 100x lens, to increase the amount of light that can be collected by the objective lens. Any question about any of that? So just remember, whenever light changes from one media to another, like in the glass slide and then the, wa uh, the air, a light will bend, and we call that refraction. Another thing you should know is our light microscopes have bright field illumination where the object will appear darker than the background, meaning this part of the slide is getting the light directly and that's why it looks white. And here you can see the light coming from the lamp, going through the specimen and then being collected by the objective lens. The specimen uh, is pigmented, and so it will appear darker than the background of the slide. And bright field illumination is the microscopes which are used in our lab, and generally most light microscopes use bright field illumination. You should also know that there is dark field illumination, and you only need to know the concept. You don't know, need to know exactly what is going on in dark field illumination. But you should know that dark field illumination has a disk in between the light source and the specimen. So that when the light comes to the specimen, the direct ray of light is blocked by the disk. And that's why the background of the slide in dark field illumination will appear dark because there's no light coming through right here from the light source because it's blocked by this disk. Any question about that? Some of the light which is not directly coming from the light to the specimen, to the lens, because the light that's directly coming from that way is blocked by the disc, but some of the light coming to the specimen can be refracted by the specimen. And when the light is bent, some of it can be bent and collected by the objective lens. And so the light coming through the specimen can be bent and be collected by the objective lens. And that's why the specimen is, oh, what do we say, lighter in color. It has some light as opposed to the background of the slide, which is totally dark. And that is the way that dark field illumination works. Any question about any of that? All right. Um, I think I'll stop here and continue with the lab because the next topic is the electron microscope and I've got several slides on the electron microscope. All right, any question at all about chapter three? Oh, not there. Let's put it All right, since there's no questions, I'm going to shut this down and move on to the lab, which will be lab three on microscopes. So hopefully you appreciate my covering microscopes in the lecture, because you're now going to use it in the lab.
Okay, Lab Module 3, uh, Microscope Basics. Looks like the spacing on this file has gotten confused. Uh, so there is some reading that you should do. You should read the textbook on Chapter 3 through the end of the section on the Compound Light Microscope before you do this lab. The learning objections, even though you're not physically going to be using the microscope, you are expected upon completion of the lab to be able to locate and name the parts of the compound microscope as well as describing their functions. Be able to calculate the total magnification for each objective that is used. Know the guidelines for focusing the specimen with the different objectives. Meaning we have different objectives and you should know the guidelines and how we focus when we're using each objective. Be able to estimate the size of a specimen when it's viewed at the different magnification powers. Any question about that last one? All right. Understand the rules for proper microscope care. Even though you are not going to be working with real microscopes, everything you do will be done online. You do need to understand the rules for proper use and maintenance of a microscope. And then lastly, be able to find the terms associated with the microscope. All right, you should memorize the names and the functions of these parts of the microscope. Let's move that over here. So one, the ocular lens, two, the objective lenses, three, the stage, four, the stage clip, five, that is the uh, dial for moving the stage clip, Six, that's the dial for the iris diaphragm. The iris diaphragm is a shutter that can open or close as needed. Uh, seven, the uh, condense, not the condenser, the, uh, yeah, the condenser. Uh, eight, the coarse focus knob. And nine, the fine, fine focus knob. Ten, the... Uh, light switch for turning on and off the light. 11, the rheostat to adjust the intensity of the light. And I think the lab doesn't call it a rheostat. I don't remember if they call it the light intensity dial or something like that. But you turn it up to get more light, you turn it down to get less light. And then 12, the lamp. You must know these parts of the microscope. And they're all given right here. Uh, I call it a lamp. It's also called an illuminator. There it is, the light intensity dial. I call it the rheostat, okay, for controlling the lamp. You should also memorize this table. It gives the objective lens by its magnification and then the name of the lens. Please note that the low power lens is not the lowest objective lens and the high power objective lens is not the highest power lens and because of that I tend not to use these names I tend to use these names meaning I give them a numerical number uh, I might occasionally call things the oil immersion lens which is the 100x objective lens Okay, any question about that? You should know the total magnification for each uh, objective lens. You should also know that the 4X objective has the deepest field of view, depth of field, sorry, depth of field. Let me put that inside here. Uh, what that means is when you're looking at an object, let's see if this will show up, yes it is. You can see from the top or the bottom of the object 
with the 4X lens because it has the greatest depth of field. And as you increase the magnification of the objective lens, you will decrease that depth of field. And then when you get the 100X oil immersion lens, instead of having something where you can see three dimensions of the object, meaning the top and the bottom, all you'd be able to see would be one plane of that object. And then anything above the plane will not be clearly visible, and anything below the plane would not be clearly visible. Any questions on any of that? All right. The scanning lens, or the 4X objective lens, has the largest field of view. So you can see the most area under the 4X lens. As you increase the power of the objective lens, the field of view will decrease. And then when you get the 100X objective lens, the field of view will be just a pinprick compared to the 4X lens, which is a large, I don't know, cone. So this makes the 4X lens the easiest one to use because when you're looking at a specimen, you can see the largest area of the slide under the microscope because it has the largest field of view. You can also see the specimen the best because it has the largest depth of field. So you don't have to be exactly focused on the specimen and you can still see it with the 4X lens. The hardest lens to use is the 100X objective lens because it has the smallest field of view. So you're seeing the least amount of area of the slide and it has the smallest depth of field which really uh, the depth of field for uh, uh, the 100X lens is only one plane. All right, any question about any of that? You should note that when you see an image under the microscope, not only is it magnified, but it is also inverted and reversed. For example, the letter E here will be magnified to the letter here the letter E here, which is magnified, inverted, and reversed. Any question about that? All right. The iris diaphragm can be opened or closed to allow more or less light to uh, hit the uh, specimen. Uh, more importantly, the iris diaphragm affects the contrast of the specimen against the background of the field of view. And so what you want to do with the iris diaphragm is have it fairly open when you're using the 4X lens. And then as you increase your... Uh, magnification lens, you should start shutting down that iris diaphragm. And then when you get to the 100X lens, you should only have it open about a pinprick. And if you notice, this is following the field of view for the objective lens. What you want to get maximum contrast from the iris diaphragm is you have the iris diaphragm open about the size of your field of view so that the cone of light coming up from the lamp is the same size as your field of view and that will give you maximum contrast and maximum resolution. If you don't shut down the iris diaphragm as you increase the power of the 
objective lens, then you may not be able to see your specimen under the 100x lens. And it's just because the iris diaphragm is wide open and we're not getting enough contrast between the specimen and the background glass of the slide. And so you're not able to see your specimen. Is that clear? All right. So when you first use the microscope and you're first looking at your specimen, you should use the 4X lens because it's the easiest lens to find your specimen on the slide. Then once you have your specimen, uh, use coarse focus to get it in uh, good focus. And then to get it in perfect focus, use the fine focus knob. Then move your specimen to the center of your field of view. Uh, let me see. Maybe I can use my nose as the center of your field of view. Because if the specimen is off away from the center of view, and then you go to a higher lens, you'll have a smaller field of view, and the specimen will no longer be in the field of view. So you need to move your specimen to the center of your field of view before you go up to the next higher objective lens. Any question about any of that? When you go to the next lens, you should never use the for course focus knob for adjusting anymore. Our microscopes are parafocal. That means that the different lenses, I'm trying to show you with two pencils, the different lenses, uh, when you switch from one lens to another, the specimen should be in focus. It might not be perfect focus, but generally you just adjust the fine focus a little bit and it'll be in, in good focus then. So that's what parafocal lens means where when you're looking at the specimen with one lens and then you switch to another lens, the, the uh, gosh, it's fading in and out there. Let's put it where my shirt is. Uh, the specimen will be in focus with both lenses. We can't yeah. see your screen or your... Okay. You can't see my screen. Or we can see your screen, but we can't see what you're doing. Uh, yeah, I'm showing you over my face because that's the only part that's doing it oh. okay okay uh meaning i can't show it over where the text is i can only show you where my face is okay so i was trying to show you there the point is is that the microscope lenses are parafocal and so uh once you're no longer using the 4x lens you should only use the fine focus. And if you use the coarse focus, you will throw off the focus of the microscope. And then the best thing to do is to start all over and get it into focus again with the 4X lens. Okay? So don't use the coarse focus knob except when you're working with the 4X objective lens. And then all other focusing should only be done with the fine focus knob. Once you have it in focus with the 10x lens, you then move the specimen into the middle of the center of the field of view and then go up to the next uh, higher objective lens, which would be the 40x objective lens. And then use the fine focus to get it in perfect focus, move it to the center of your field of view, and then switch in the 100X lens. 
Repeat steps nine whenever you switch from one objective lens to the next higher objective lens. When you go from the 40x lens to the 100x lens, the 100x lens is no better than the 40x lens unless you add oil. And so the 100x lens should use oil. And what you do is you rotate the 40x lens halfway out, bring the 100x lens, I'll make it a different thing. You don't bring it to where the specimen is. You only bring it about halfway to where the specimen is. And then you add a drop of oil to where the specimen is over the light on the microscope. Make it only a small drop of oil, one drop. And then the oil reduces the refraction of light so that more light can be collected by the objective lens and that will increase the resolution and the clarity of the image. If you use oil, you must always remove oil from the lens when you are done using the microscope. And obviously you put oil on the 100x lens, so you should check that lens for oil. You should also check the 40x lens to see if it's picked up oil because the 40x lens is down deep enough that if you rotate it through where the specimen is, the 40x lens will pick up the oil. So when you're cleaning the microscope for oil, you should always clean the 100x because it'll have oil. And then you should also check the 40x lens in case it accidentally picked up oil. To clean the oil off the lens, you should only use lens paper. It is true that we do have a lens cleaning solution, but students, at least in our lab, do not use the lens cleanser. Uh, they tell the professor that their lens is dirty, and then the professor comes and cleans the lens with the lens cleanser. Is that make sense? So for students, all you need to do to clean the lens is use lens paper. You should never use regular paper, chem wipes, if you know what that is, uh, paper towels, or any other paper on the lenses. The reason is paper has wood fibers in it, and wood fibers will scratch the lens. And of course, the lenses are the most expensive part of the microscope. And if you scratch them, you'll damage the lens. And uh, we need to replace them or you can't see through it clearly. So you should never use paper on the objective lenses. You should only use lens paper, which is a special paper that has been treated to remove the wood fibers from the lens paper. Any question about any of that? All right, I'll let you read about troubleshooting and then let's talk about the activities you're gonna be doing in this lab. Online students are not gonna perform any of these activities with a real microscope. Therefore, the table has been filled in for you, but you will be expected to know the information contained in the table and how to use the formula in point five below. So read through the lab, that's what you're doing. And normally the students would actually measure the field of view for each of the objective lenses. And we've done that for you, where we filled in the measurements. Because you can't obviously do that because you're not gonna be in a real lab handling a real microscope. And then you can use the measurement of the field of view to determine the size of the specimen that you observe. For example, if you're looking at a specimen under the 4x lens, 
and the specimen takes up one half of the field of view, that's its size, you can estimate that the specimen is about 2.25 millimeters in size because the field of view is 4.5 millimeters and the specimen is taking up about half of the field of view. You will need to use this table to answer some of the questions in the lab worksheet. Okay? And I don't care if you answer your answers in millimeters or if you answer them in micrometers. In activity two, you're not going to be performing this activity, but you will be doing a virtual exercise over the internet, completing the laboratory exercise at the end of the document. We expect that you will know and understand the material in that exercise. A virtual, what do we call it, a virtual lab activity is where you will be working with a program that is simulating a microscope online. And you will be going through the same steps you would use online for using the microscope. So go ahead and read through activity two, observing how to make a prepared slide. Activity three, we're giving it to you for your own information, but you are not going to be performing this activity and you're not going to be tested on this procedure. But this is how to make a wet mount. You're not going to be handling a real microscope, but you are expected to know how to correctly store a real microscope. So to put away a microscope after you're done using the microscope, you should lower the stage all the way down, meaning completely. You should remove the slide and put it away. If you use immersion oil, you should wipe uh, oil off of the 100x objective lens using lens paper only. And you should check the 40x lens in case oil got on the 40x lens. You should then rotate the objective lens so the 4x objective is put in place over where the specimen was. You should lower the light intensity to a minimum. You should turn the power off, unplug the microscope, and wrap the cord neatly around the microscope. Uh, you don't need to worry about that. I tell my students not to do number seven. Uh, and then using both hands, grasp the microscope with two hands, one hand holding the arm of the microscope and then one hand underneath the microscope to support it on its base. Uh, you always grasp the microscope with two hands to ensure that you don't drop the microscope, okay? And then put the microscope back in the sub same cubby hole that you got it from and put it away in the way it was put, initially put in the cubby hole. All right. You should know the terms about a microscope, so go through those, read through them. You don't need to do anything with the references. And then go through the laboratory exercise. Uh, I think that's a video. Yep, that's a video on general focusing of a microscope, and then a video on how to use oil on a microscope. And then here is the virtual microscope, which it may be slow to download, especially if your system is a slow, you have a slow internet connection, but let it download and then use the program to simulate using a microscope. You should also practice naming the parts of a microscope. And uh, let me open that up. Ah. 
It's rather loud, so let me take that off because I keep doing that wrong. All right, so this is a little game on the internet, and uh, I think I've got directions for how to do that. I shouldn't have done that. Oh, that's all right. Something different. No, it isn't. Yep, I gotta back up on this. Nope, where the heck is it? <laughs> ah, here it is. All right, so I do have it here. Um, I don't have directions for using this, so let me try and figure out how to use that. And uh, I think you press start. Uh, you don't need to download anything, but you do need to press start. And then you should be able to... If you click back... Yeah, that's not right. Something's wrong here. And then in the middle of the microscope... Oh, there it is there. Thank you. <laughs> Staring at it. Click that button, and then you should be able to... Uh, start the quiz. It says the word on the top, and then you find. Oh, there it is. Do find the fine adjustment knob, and then click it. And I'm gonna guess it's this one. Diaphragm. Okay, so that must have been correct. So it's moving on. The diaphragm is here. Course adjustment knob is here. Anyways, this is how you take the the quiz. And it'll tell you what your score is right here. Okay? You do not need to push the start button. And you do not want to download anything on your computer. Uh, thank you for your assistance there. I just wanted to show you how to do this. I knew it was pretty simple. And uh, if you answer the wrong question, like let's go here. It will subtract a point. Okay? So the arm is right here. You have to click the blue thing for it to, to work. The ocular lens right there. All right. Any questions on this? If not, let me shut it down. And come back to where I was. And then fill in the answers, not in this lab module. Come to the worksheet, and there will be a worksheet to lab three. And the worksheet is a much smaller document. Let me go ahead and take this off. The worksheet is a much smaller document, and it should uh, have the same questions but it, this is what one or two pages at most it's only one page and then answer the questions and then submit it to the folder for lab three you need to submit it by 11:59 p.m on saturday to receive full credit okay and then i will grade it in the lab i consider the lab a learning exercise and after I grade it, I'll tell you what questions are wrong, and then I'll give you a few days for making corrections, and then get the corrections in by the due date. And if you have all the correct answers, you will then get full credit for the lab. I think the labs are worth five points. Any questions about that? All right. If there's no questions, I will be here until 8 o'clock to answer questions. So go ahead and get started on the lab. I'm going to end the lab a little bit earlier than normal because I've got to uh, run an errand. Okay, so I'm going to end at 8 o'clock today. And I will make it up to you some other time. Okay? 
All right, so go ahead and get started in the lab. I'll be here until 8 o'clock to help you with any questions.